Hi, my name is Martin. In November 2009, I gazed at the wonderful ultra deep field images of the Hubble Space Telescope, and I was amazed how far back in time and distance astronomers could see. Just being curious, I wanted to know more, and I started to search the internet for more information and knowledge. The ultra deep field images, the one shown here, give us a view of the universe more than 12 billion years ago and more than 12 billion light years away. Thousands of smaller and irregular galaxies are visible. So why don't we stare straight into the Big Bang? Why don't we see the dense and fiery beginnings of space and time? Of course, later I learned more about the universe, about the Big Bang and other theories. But my initial, a bit naive, questions started unwittingly my puzzle of the universe. In the years that followed, I tried to solve my little puzzle, and to my own surprise, I have found a theoretical model for how the universe could work. However, this model is completely opposite of the Big Bang Theory, as you will see in this video. Hopefully you will enjoy this video, and perhaps after seeing it, you may become even more curious and want to know more about the universe around us. Enjoy it. This is a 3D reconstruction of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, made by space agencies NASA and ESA. We are looking towards the visible edge of space and time. All the white blobs are young galaxies, not stars. The distances of all galaxies are measured, so this is an accurate 3D fly-through representation of this tiny part of the universe. Are we staring straight into the Big Bang? And where are the hot and fiery beginnings of space and time? Those were the naive questions I had in the early years. This tiny red blob coming up is a very distant object, a very young core galaxy, more than 12 billion light years away. Point at the full moon with your index finger and the moon will disappear behind it easily. The moon is about half a degree wide. Now divide the surface of the moon in 100 equal parts. Only one part is the view area of the Hubble Space Telescope. This Hubble Ultra Deep Field image is taken by an upgraded Hubble Space Telescope. This image shows about 5,500 proto-galaxies in the southern sky in the constellation Fornax. It took 2 million seconds exposure time, that is 23 days, to see the farthest and the earliest visible objects and more than 30 billion years away, just 480 million years after the Big Bang. Incredible. Later I found out that the ultra deep field images were also taken in opposite directions. That tells us that the universe in the early beginning was quite big and in the sphere all around us. It must have developed itself within a very short 480 million years, just after the Big Bang. A universe with a radius of at least 13.2 billion light years. Of course, matter cannot travel in 480 million years from zero into a sphere of 13.2 billion light years. That's way faster than the speed of light. So how can a universe come into existence with a radius that big in a very short time, and who knows, perhaps in zero time. My puzzle of the universe started right here. Let's make a thought experiment. The challenge is, how can I make a universe from a singularity within 500 million years, without matter exceeding the speed of light, and then have it slowly expand with Hubble's constant? 
it seemed at first impossible. But then I had this crazy idea. What if the singularity, that single point of mass, was embedded in its own gravity field? Then this gravity field must have been as huge as a pre-existing universe. If there was a Big Bang moment, then this gravity field, as a hypothesis, must have transformed or materialized into matter. Not normal matter, but dark matter. Into a cloud of expanding dark matter. Then the next step, the only possibility left was to hypothesize again that the cloud of dark matter should have condensed or materialized into baryonic matter, which is normal matter. As a consequence, condensation will lead to release some sort of energy. In this case, I choose for electromagnetic radiation, and this had to be the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, all of a sudden, I had found a very simple concept model for our universe. Let me summarize this model. This universe model evolves in three stages. The edge of the universe is represented by a circle. Before time t is zero, the universe was a singularity with an empty, universe-sized gravity field around it. Here I call t is zero the Big Bang moment, because in this model there is no hot Big Bang, but just a moment, and it's more of a phase transition. At time t is zero, for a yet unknown reason, the gravity field materializes everywhere instantaneously into a cloud of expanding dark matter particles. These so-called particles may have properties like mass, position and speed, all well below the speed of light, of course. At this stage there is no normal matter yet, therefore the overall temperature is zero degrees Kelvin. The absolute absolute zero temperature. After time is zero, the cloud of dark matter of the young newly formed universe, just like in a cloud of mist, will slowly condensate into, I call them, tiny little droplets of baryonic matter, or subatomic matter. The condensation process will release the CMB radiation that Penzias and Wilson measured for the first time in the 1960s. In the next slides I have worked out in more detail my theoretical model of the universe. More puzzle work in progress. In this model, the energy is the sing of the singularity and its gravity field, as seen on the left, is stored just like a compressed spring. After the transition, the energy is conserved into the expanding dark matter cloud, as shown on the right. Later I learned that a singularity with a gravity field is in fact the description of a black hole. The pre-existing universe is in fact a black hole. This turned out to be an important step closer in solving my puzzle. The energy stored in the black hole must be the same as the energy stored in the dark matter cloud. You can even write down the energy equations in both states, but that didn't bring me much closer to a, to a more detailed model. It took me quite some time to realize that perhaps there was no phase transition at all, because the word is can also mean equal sign and may tell us literally is the same before and after, not just at the time t is zero. So put the two phases together, and there you have it. A black hole is made out of moving dark matter. We finally arrive at the heart of my concept model of the universe. If this model turns out to be correct, we apparently live in a huge black hole universe. Any black hole big or small, is made out of oscillating dark matter, because dark matter falls freely and frictionless. All particles will oscillate up and down from event horizon to event horizon. 
The maximum speed in a black hole is reached in the center and is by definition the speed of light. The temperature is zero degree Kelvin, the absolute zero temperature. After five years of struggling and puzzling, this is my basic hypothetical model of the universe. As mentioned, it is a universe-sized black hole with finite mass m universe and a finite radius r universe. And we do have a center. But what about the expanding universe? We all know that the universe is expanding, isn't it? With this question, I almost gave up my puzzle. Luckily, the model itself gives an answer. Have a look at the red arrows that represent the directions of falling galaxies. All three galaxies are falling towards the center. Consider yourself living in the middle positioned galaxy. What do you see as you fall down from event horizon to the center? The galaxy below you, the one close to the center, falls faster than your galaxy and therefore moves away from, from you. And why is it faster? Because it had more time to accelerate. The galaxy above you, the one closer to the event horizon, has a lower falling speed and is also moving away from you. Why? Because your own galaxy again, in the middle, had more time to accelerate than the galaxy above you. This reasoning is applicable to all galaxies, because every galaxy finds itself somewhere in between galaxies. So their inhabitants will see their neighboring galaxies moving away from them. It looks like as if the universe is expanding. But as you can see in the drawing, the universe is not expanding, but has a fixed volume. And what about condensation of dark matter? Again, this model gives an answer how dark matter can condensate and suggests an interesting property of gravity inside the universe. As dark matter falls, it follows the gravity field lines which are focused to the center. That is the reason why dark matter will be compressed and condensate into baryonic matter during its fall. Baryonic matter is continuously produced throughout the whole universe. That is why CMB radiation comes from every direction and is made in recent times from nearby local cosmological distances. And that is why the temperatures are all around us in the universe are measured about 3 degrees Kelvin because it all starts from 0 degree Kelvin. So the famous horizon problem is solved within this model. But more about the horizon problem and other problems uh, later in separate videos. And there is more that the model can tell us. What is our ultimate fate in the, in, the, in the future? What happens to all dark matter and normal matter that collides in the center? Here I hypothesize that matter spaghettifies in the center and spaghettification, perhaps you know it, is a scientific explanation for vertical stretching and horizontal compressing in very strong non-homogeneous gravity fields. Matter will stretch into spaghettified strands, as, it, uh, as they say. But in what does matter spaghettify? And the only logical explanation in this model, normal matter spaghettifies into dark matter again. So the universe recycles matter. It makes matter, it produces radiation, and in the end it breaks down matter into dark matter again. A perfect recycling process. So what is the fate of our universe? The big rip, unfortunately. Um, did I solve my puzzle of the universe? I think in concept, yes. But now it's time to do some calculations and put the model to the ultimate test. At this point, you may think this model of the universe is just a nice story, or a simple theory at the most. Can you prove it, or make predictions? 
To be honest, I had similar thoughts and had my doubts. Over time, I have found more convincing arguments to support this model. And these are now presented in the following slides. Looking at the model, it appeared to me that as you fall through the universe, you calculate your speed in the same way as if you were falling through a hole through the earth. Just with algebra, Newton laws and formulas for harmonic motion, we can derive properties of the model. For those who are not familiar or uncomfortable with equations, don't mind the deductions, just take a look at the end results. This is the expression for the acceleration, GU, that you feel as if you were standing on top of the event horizon. And this is the effective acceleration, GR, that you experience if you were inside the universe and it's proportional with R. All calculated by falling through the Earth method. Now calculating the falling speed VR. The kinetic energy of mass M in the center is equal to the potential energy of mass M dropped from a height R. Preparing for calculus, a small drop over height delta R gives a small increase in kinetic energy. Next, the total kinetic energy is equal to the sum of the potential energy over many increments delta R. Next, Vr squared is proportional to this expression. Next, Vr is this equation with constant part and R squared. Taking the square root from both sides, Vr is proportional with R. This part here is a constant. Something remarkable happened here. This expression looks a lot like hubble lemaitre law. V is h times d. V is the speed of the galaxies moving away from each other. h is the Hubble's constant and d is the distance between galaxies. I almost fell off my chair when I saw this result. This can't be true. Did I find an explanation for the famous almost 100 year old law in cosmology? From this point on, I started to believe in my own model of the universe a little bit more, as you can imagine. Something nice happened again. Suddenly I can calculate the radius of the universe. Because by definition the maximum speed in the center is the speed of light, called c. This is h, vr is c, if r is ru, and ru is the radius of the universe. We have the following yellow expression, ru is c divided by h, speed of light divided by Hubble's constant. h is known, and let's take the latest value of 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Our universe is calculated 14.6 giga light years or 14.6 billion light years. Now that RU is known, we can even calculate more properties of the universe. Following directly out of the known radius RU, the mass MU is the total mass of the universe. The radius RU of the black hole is in this yellow expression. Note that the Newtonian radius and the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole has an extra factor 2. The difference is caused by the escape velocity c, the speed of light, at the event horizon, while the speed of light in our model is reached in the center. The total mass of the universe is 1.86 10 to the power 53 kilograms. Please note that mass mu in this model is 100% dark matter. The age of the universe is the age of falling matter and is determined by the falling time of each object that falls from event horizon to center. The age is a quarter of the period time T universe. 
a quarter of period time T U is 20, 22.9 billion years. And that's way longer than the 13.8 billion years of the Big Bang model. The universe as a whole is contained in a fixed volume and probably has an infinite age. Curious enough, if dark matter particle is also considered as an electromagnetic magnetic wave, sorry, then the mass of a dark matter particle, MBM, can be calculated as well. The kinetic energy of each dark matter particle, um, Einstein's a famous formula E is mc squared is equal to Planck Einstein's formula h times fu where h is Planck's constant and fu the lowest oscillating frequency of the universe. MBM is an unbelievably small 2.55 10 to the power minus 68 kilograms way smaller than smallest considered Planck mass 2.18 10 to the power minus Eight kilogram. And just for fun, the total number z of a dark matter particle in the uh, universe is 7.30 10 to the powers 121. The total number I call z in honor of Fritz Wicke, uh, who coined the name dark matter or dunkler materia in the 1930s. Let's summarize our universe model. Where are we? We are submerged inside a huge ball of oscillating dark matter. It's an immense black hole. How it works? Newton's laws rule, but also Einstein's theory of special relativity, as we will see. Normal dark matter fall in spherical isochronous layers to the center. I call them isochronous layers because all clocks in each layer will run at the same rate because they are falling with the same speed just applying Einstein's theory of special relativity the lower layers are older and time will even stop when the speed of light is reached in the center where it all stops as our galaxy is torn to pieces in a big rip while falling, dark matter is compressed, interacts with itself by condensation and produces baryonic matter and releases cosmic microwave background radiation. Dark matter is the building material of normal matter. Energy and mass are conserved. A recyclic cosmology. And the name of this hypothetical universe model is in Dutch Helal in Vrije Val or in English Universe in Free Fall. A theory can be proven with observations and measurements. In the last hundred years many astronomical observations have been made. The challenge is to have them matched and explained in the theory. Let's put our model to the ultimate test. Earlier in this presentation I have calculated with this, this formula here and explained why the, there is a Hubble constant h and why the universe is not expanding. Now one of the most controversial claims is this. Our universe has a center. If the age of the Milky Way is said to be more than 13 billion years old, it has fallen quite some time and quite a distance. The center must be nearby or at least visible. So I searched for cosmological evidence and to my own surprise, there it was. The Great Attractor, situated in the Laniakea supercluster. It's not more than 250 million light years away and it was discovered in the 70s of the last century and is said to be a, an anomaly and unexplained. A few hundred thousands of galaxies are attracted to a point in the universe where they seem to disappear. 
This phenomenon perfectly matches the prediction of a center in our universe. And exactly as predicted in the model, before and behind the center, relatively close to each other, we should see red and blue shifted galaxies falling away and falling towards us. Although difficult to measure directly opposite the great attractor, we can expect, uh, we can expect blue shifted galaxies with redshifts of z is minus 10 or even more. With the center, we can predict more phenomena. And that is why the sky is divided in two. Half the sky is redshifted. The other half, opposite the great attractor, is blue shifted. Because matter falls towards us. Red and blue shifted regions have been observed, as seen here in the drawing. The raw and unfiltered CMB radiation is the so-called dipole. It divides the sky also in two halves. It measures a temperature around 2.7 degrees Kelvin. A little warmer to the center, slightly colder on the opposite side. It was one of the first observations that supported the existence of a center. The temperature difference is only 3.3 milli degrees Kelvin. This may also provide an explanation for the so-called horizon problem, although in this model the CMB radiation is here explained as radiation from nearby cosmological regions, and not from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. More information I hope to give in separate videos. The cosmological principle says the universe is homogene and isotrope. Homogene means everywhere on large scales the same matter distribution. Isotrope is the same matter distribution in all directions. The geometry of this model predicts the opposite, a non-homogene universe. And it does produce large structures on large scales. The structures will curve and will be concentric because they tend to follow isochronic layers. The center focus gravity pulls matter vertically apart and attracts matter sideways in the curved layers. Just like spaghettification, but here on large scales. At more distance we see greater structures with the same redshift values. A few examples. CFA2 Great Wall at 2 million light years. The Sloan Great Wall, 1 billion light years away. The huge large quasar group at 9.9 .9 billion light years distance. And Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall at 10 billion light years. These are all a few examples of a long list of large structures that support the universe in free fall model. In the near future, new generation telescopes can see further and in more detail into deep space. The James Webb Space Telescope will see in the infrared spectra hopefully from this summer 2022. The ground-based VLT telescopes in Chile will see further to the edges of our universe in the optical spectrum with even larger adaptive optics. Hopefully both telescopes will make new discoveries and may support my model of the universe. To conclude, I have made a list of predictions that could be measured by the new generation telescopes. And here's the list. Half the dis distant sky is blue shifted, as stated earlier before in this presentation. Extreme blue shifted galaxies nearby the great attractor of Z, Z is minus 10, or even higher blue shift values, hopefully can be measured. However, it is technically probably very difficult to measure, especially with those high blue shifts values behind the zone of avoidance, where our own Milky Way is blocking our view into deep space. Now the most controversial claim in the UFF model. Because of the isochronous layers, 
time will run slower and even stop in the center. The speed of light will decrease yearly with a factor of 1 divided by the radius of the universe. All clocks on Earth will also run slower every year by this factor. Take both factors into account and the speed of light will decrease with about 4 cm per year. There is an indirect way that could prove the speed of light is slowing down yearly, but it's a bit complicated. I'll try to explain it as easily as possible. The distance of the Moon to the Earth is continuously measured by NASA and is said to drift away each year with plus 3.8 centimeters. The measurements are taken by a laser beam pointing at the reflectors on the Moon placed by Apollo missions in the 70s. If you take the decreased speed of light and slower ticking clocks into account, then a non-drifting Moon would measure a drift of even plus 5.2 cm per year. This is just the effect of the decrease of the speed of light. So in reality, a plus 5.2 cm value means 0 cm drift. Just subtract 5.2 cm as a systematic error per year, and then you have measured the correct value. Now back to the plus 3.8 cm drift of the Moon. If we subtract for the error, then we have a plus 3.8 minus 5.2, that is minus 1.4 cm per year. So this means the Moon falls slowly to the Earth with 1.4 cm per year. And this makes more sense to me, because the Earth is becoming heavier each year with 50,000 ton of dust and meteorites from space. The Moon becomes heavier too with an, I estimate, 10,000 tons per year with the same dust and meteorites from uh, deep space. But with 14 kilometers per 1 million per year, sorry, 14 kilometers per 1 million year, we should not worry too much about the Moon falling to the Earth. If all spiral galaxies are embedded in a huge disk of dark matter dotted with stars, then calculations show us that the rotation speed, VR, of any matter particle that is rotating around the center of a galaxy is proportional with the square root of R. I'll show this in later uh, videos, of course, in more detail. So. This calculation may explain the slightly increased rotation curves, even in the outskirts of the galaxy disk where only neutral hydrogen uh, has been found. And last but not least, in the 90s of the last century, the age of some globular, globular star clusters were measured way older than 13.8 billion years, even up to 20 billion years. They perfectly fit into the UFF model. However, these measurements fell victim to the predominant Big Bang theory. And nothing is older than the universe itself, of course. In fact, any observation me or measurement today, or the ones of tomorrow, will suffer from the Big Bang paradigm. Finally, to conclude, I'm aware that my model of a free-falling universe in all aspects is quite controversial and I have not seen comparable theories at this moment. But I do hope you like my presentation and I'd like to hear your thoughts. In the meantime, I will make more detailed videos that may support my universe model and it will keep me going on puzzling. For now, whatever the future may bring, be critical, curious and stay open for new and wonderful discoveries in the universe. You have seen 12 years of my puzzle of the universe. The questions remain, but now I can share them with you. Is a puzzle of the universe really solved? 
Is there really an edge to the universe, as seen on the more than a century old wood engraving? Hope to see you again in my next videos. Thank you for watching.